here for a couple of months on Sunday mornings, we are taking a long, hard look at the cross together. I think that I could easily preach until midnight tonight. And if I did that, I probably would have said just about all I know to say to you, to inform you what the Bible says about the cross of Christ and to try to urge you to do the right thing about it. And some of the lessons you've already found out in the first two in this series are going to run a little bit long. But I hope you believe that Jesus Christ is worth it and that your soul is that valuable and that the souls of those people that are sitting around you are worth it too. I know that some of you, uh, every time we're together, you're sitting here on these hardback pews with physical conditions that make it a challenge to listen for as, as long as we make you do it here. And some of you are sitting with little people who find it a challenge to sit still for this long anywhere at all, doing anything. I understand that, and I really appreciate you for hanging in with us. If you were here last week, I wonder if you were able to follow me as far as I was trying to lead you in our study. Again, this morning, we're going to center on the cross in the Gospels as we learn what Jesus wants us to learn about it, and we'll be moving in a different direction next week. And before this is all over we're going to be thinking about the joy that comes because of the cross. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, that Jesus endured the cross, despising its shame, for the joy that was set before Him. There's joy after the cross. And we sang about victory in Jesus a while ago because of His blood. And that's reality for us today who are in Christ. But that joy came at the most terrible cost to Christ. And that victory was hard fought. And we need to sit at the cross for a little while and drink it in and and let it touch our hearts just as deeply as we can before we're really going to know the victory that comes from it or to live with the joy that we have because of the cross of Christ. Now, where were we going last week? Last week, we looked at people who were directly responsible for the death of Christ on the cross, considered the kinds of sins that nailed Him to the cross. There was envy on the part of those Jewish leaders. There was greed in the heart of Judas. There was a crowd that was ignorant and was able to be frenzied to to do the will of these religious leaders who were misled. There was Pilate who could have done something about it, but wouldn't. He was so self-centered. And there were those Roman soldiers who actually carried it out, who had to be very hard-hearted to do that. Now, I confess in front of you that I've been guilty of all the same kinds of attitudes that drove those people to send Jesus to the cross. I've been hard-hearted. And I've been self-centered. And I've done some things wrong because of ignorance. And greed and envy have motivated me. Did you, in your minds, in your hearts, confess that yourself last week? Perhaps so. But maybe you weren't able to follow all the way where that was going because you're like me. Even though all of those things have characterized my life, and unfortunately still do some, I cannot see myself among the people crying out for the crucifixion of Jesus. I can't picture myself being so self-centered when I could stop this from happening. I was in the shoes of Pilate, not doing what I could do. I have a hard time seeing myself actually betraying Jesus into the hands of people that I know want to kill him the way Judas did. 
I really, really cannot see myself planting a crown of thorns on the head of Jesus and definitely not driving spikes through his hands and feet to nail him to the cross. I can't see myself exactly in all those shoes. Even though those same attitudes that drove those people can be found in my heart and have been found there, I just can't see myself doing those things. Jesus himself said, while all of this is going on, in John chapter 19, verse 11, that there are varying levels of culpability for what happened to him. He was telling Pilate there that you wouldn't have any authority over me. You wouldn't have a role in this at all unless God had given it to you. And so he said, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of the greater sin. He's talking about Judas, of course. And in Matthew chapter 26, verse 24, when he's predicting his betrayal, a few hours before it happened, he told his disciples... Woe to that man who would betray me. It'd be better for him if he had never been born. It's hard to see myself so out of control as to be a participant in all of these things that happened in Jerusalem over the course of less than 24 hours, a night and into the next day. It looks like everything was out of control then. But God was in control. God used the awful motivations of humans and their terrible deeds to accomplish His good plan. The first passage to which I want to call your attention this morning is Matthew chapter 16, verse 21. The Bible says, from that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed, and on the third day be raised. Now, this is a few months before Jesus is crucified, but I want you to underscore, at least in your mind, if not in your Bible, this word here. Jesus begins to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and scribes and be killed. Jesus said, must. Jesus said, it was necessary. Now, sometimes Jesus looked ahead to those events and he just told what would happen. For example, a chapter later, chapter 17, verses 22 and 23 It says, as they were gathering Galilee, Jesus said to them, the Son of Man is about to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him, and he will be raised on the third day. His disciples were greatly distressed to hear that again, but that time he just told what would happen. On this occasion, he said, this must happen. And when we think about the context when uh, Jesus told his disciples this, Peter had just confessed that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, the Son of the living God. And Jesus was glad to hear Peter say that, and he said, Upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. It's not hard to grasp that Jesus would come and start a movement. Things needed to change. And it's not really hard to understand why Jesus would establish the church. He knows that people need each other. But flowing right out of that, when he's encouraged that confession out of Peter, and he's told what he's going to do and build his church, flowing right out of that, he begins to tell them, that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer these things and be killed. I understand those other things. And you might too, but to die in the middle of this was necessary? That didn't make any sense to Peter. And in verse 22, the Bible says that Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall never happen 
to you. That didn't make any sense to Peter. That's the last thing that ought to happen to Jesus. That's the last thing that Jesus ought to ever do. Peter had a hard time making sense of it. And ever since then, people have had a hard time making sense of the necessity of the death of Jesus on the cross. In the first century, the message of Christ crucified, according to 1 Corinthians 1.23, was an absolute scandal to Jesus' fellow Jews. And it was utter foolishness to Gentiles necessary. Doesn't it look like a whole lot more like an accident? That's the way some people, even in Christian circles, take the death of Christ and the establishment of His church. That wasn't what He meant to do when He came. But the Bible says just the opposite. It wasn't an accident. He said He must do this. It wasn't a mistake either. Some people would question whether it was even advisable for Jesus to do this. Was it even helpful for him to go to the cross? Was there any advantage? It might have been heroic or inspiring, but necessary? Was it just the best way to accomplish his goal under the the circumstances? Or what? Jesus said, must. It was necessary. Then a few chapters later in Matthew chapter 20, verse 28, he begins to tell us why. Speaking of himself, he said, The Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. According to Jesus, people get caught up in sin with no way out. In John chapter 8, verse 34, Jesus said, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. And that's not what we ever mean to get ourselves into when we choose to do the wrong thing or when we decide not to do the good and right thing. We don't intend to become slaves to sin, but Jesus says everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. There's no way out for us. Jesus said that He would have to give His life as a ransom for us. Well, that doesn't stop us from trying to think of other ways out of sin. Some people just try to deny that anything they do is sinful at all. Others will rename their sins, call it something less blameworthy. We try to ignore our guilt and Just hope that it will go away. Most often we try to make up for what we've done. We try to to get so much better and to do so much good that there couldn't be any possible reason that God would be left for holding anything against us. I read the other day in Reader's Digest a compilation interview with Stephen King that most imaginative writer behind scary books, scary movies. Here's what he said about bad guys. He said, even bad guys, most of them anyway, see themselves as good. They're the heroes of their own lives. And it's, I don't know if any of us ever, without opening the Bible... And listening to what it says about the nature of sin and about our involvement in it would ever come to the conclusion that what I've done merits hell forever after this life. We see ourselves as essentially good. We think we'll make up for our sin with something else that we do. You know, all those radical Islamists that make the news from week to week. What are they doing? They're trying on their own to atone for their sins. They're trying to atone for their sins with their own blood and with the blood of other people. They think they've got another way than what we read about in the Bible. 
And the Quran tells them that they need another way. In uh, Surah 4 in the Quran, it's sections or verses 157 and 158, they read that Jesus was not even really crucified and that he didn't even really die. And a Muslim commentator on that says that Christianity believes in the death of Christ because this is necessary for the doctrine of blood sacrifice and vicarious atonement for sins, which that's where we're going in in our study. But he says this is rejected by Islam. Outright, there is absolutely no compatibility between Islam and biblical Christianity. Because Jesus and his death on the cross are right at the heart of this message. And Islam said nothing could be further than the truth and that Jesus died, especially that he was crucified for the sins of other people. Uh, There's a writer named John Dixon. He writes from a Christian perspective. And he was speaking on a university campus some time ago. His theme that evening was the wounds of God. That's the way it was advertised, and he talked about the cross. Well, after it was all over, the master of ceremonies told the audience that Mr. Dixon would be happy to take questions from anyone. Well, immediately, a man raised his hand and stood up, and he was a a mid-30s spokesman for and representative of Islam on that campus. And he began to question Mr. Dixon this way and to challenge him. He said how preposterous it was to claim that the creator of the universe would be subjected to the forces of his own creation. That he'd have to eat, that he'd have to sleep, some other things he said, let alone die on the cross. Well, Mr. Dixon and the man went back and forth publicly for about ten minutes while everyone's listening with rapt attention. And this man insisted that the notion of God himself coming in the flesh and being wounded, whether physically or emotionally, was not only illogical, since the creator of causes could not possibly be caused pain by a lesser entity. He said it was outright blasphemy, as stated in the Quran. Mr. Dixon later wrote, I had no knockdown argument, no witty comeback. The debate was probably too amicable for either approach anyway. In the end, I simply thanked him for demonstrating for the audience the radical contrast between the Islamic conception of God And that described in the Bible. He said what the Muslim denounces as blasphemy, the Christian holds as precious. God has wounds. Islam doesn't get it, do you? Jesus said he came not to be served, but to serve. To give his life as a ransom for many. I'll ask you to turn with you in your Bibles to... Matthew chapter 26, and let's read verses 36 through 46 together. Matthew 26, verses 36 through 46, we're going to join Jesus in the garden of Gethsemane. He's going to be betrayed as as this reading ends. But he goes there because he feels like he has to. Beginning... In verse 36, Then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, Sit here while I go over there and pray. Taking with him Peter, the two sons of Zebedee, and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, My soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch with me. Let me pause and introduce something that someone said about that. Jesus said, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Please stay here and watch with me. Jesus needed help. 
thinking about what he's going to go through within hours, already has him at the point of death. It's that agonizing. Here's what a writer said about that. Tricia McCory Rhodes, she said, With these words, the full agony of it all sweeps through the garden like a tornado, churning the body and soul and spirit of the Son of God. Like a tornado sweeps through the garden when he arrives there, churning through his body and his soul and his spirit whenever he says, My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. And we pick up in verse 39, And going a little farther, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, My father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. He came to the disciples and found them sleeping. He said to Peter, So could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, for the second time, he went away and prayed, My father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. Again, he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. So leaving them again, he went away and prayed for the third time, saying the same words again. Then he came to the disciples and said to them, Sleep, take your rest later on. See, the hour is at hand. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. Now, if we took the time to turn and and read from Luke's account, we'd find that even with an angel having come with help from heaven, Jesus is face down in the garden, and as he's praying in this agony, his sweat becomes, as it were, drops of blood. And if we took the time to read from Mark's account, we would hear him praying, Abba, Father, closest of terms he could use to to draw near to his Father in heaven, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. I want you to think about that scene, and I want you to think who's at the center of that scene. Jesus is the one, according to John chapter 1, verses 1 and following, Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 and following, who's the agent of the creation of the universe. He could speak this whole universe into existence without breaking a sweat. But redemption is different. It has him face down in the garden in a pool of his own sweaty blood. His soul was overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. And he's praying to his father repeatedly about this cup. If it is possible, let this cup pass from me. What's that cup about? I remember a few times in the Old Testament, prior to this in our Bibles, where where cup is a refreshing picture, like Psalm 23, and my cup overflows. But, But more often in the Old Testament, when you're reading about a cup and God is involved, It's the cup full of his wrath. Psalm 75, for example, in verses 7 and 8 says, But it is God who executes judgment. For in the hand of the Lord there is a cup foaming with wine, well mixed, and he pours out from it, and all the wicked of the earth shall drain it down to the dregs. And then when we go toward the ends of our Bibles, in Revelation chapter 14, verses 10 and 11, there's an angel who says that some will drink the wine of God's wrath, poured full strength into the cup of his anger, and he'll be tormented with fire and sulfur in the presence of the holy angels, in the presence of the Lamb, and their smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever, and they'll have no rest day and night. Most of the time when we read about a cup, in the Bible, related to God, it's talking about the cup full of His wrath. 
Jesus in the garden, in an agony that's overwhelming his soul, is praying, Father, let this cup pass from me. Well, that's what it was about. God's wrath was about to be poured out on Jesus instead of on us. Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. In Mark, he said, Father, all things are possible for you. Well, if all things are possible for God, then some people think that God ought to just overlook our sin. If all things are possible for God, then why doesn't He just forget about it? If all things are possible for God, why doesn't He just get over this problem He has with our sin? Well, God can do anything that can be done, but God will always be God. And He is holy, 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 says Isaiah chapter 6, Revelation chapter 4. Habakkuk 1.13, the prophet acknowledged to God that your eyes are too pure. Your eyes are purer than to see evil and cannot just look at wrong. Now you and I, we might say something like that. God just needs to get over it. God needs to forget about it. But we really can't imagine, and we wouldn't want to ever find out what it would be like if evil never got what was coming to it. If there never came a time where God punished any evil, the bottom would fall out. The bottom would fall out of our world. The bottom would fall out of God's throne. Because the Bible says in Psalm 89 verse 14, Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Steadfast love and faithfulness go before you. So is there another way? Could there be a better plan for saving you and me from sin, for for getting us into heaven when this life is over? Psalm 147 verse 5 says, Great is our Lord and abundant in power. His understanding is beyond measure. He can do anything that can be done, and He knows how to do it. No problem. No problem for Him intellectually or or physically, if we could say that about God. But the way that God answered His Son's anguished prayer says that there is no other way. Now, if you think you know a better way to salvation for people like us than the cross, I want to ask, how long have you been thinking about that? How well thought out is your plan? And then let's compare it to what God's been doing. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 18 through 21, I read this about the God whose understanding is infinite. It says, Knowing that you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in the last times for your sake, who through Him are believers in God, who raised Him from the dead and gave Him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. When did God formulate this plan to save us by the blood of Christ? And how long has the carrying out of this plan been in the works? He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, the Bible says. In the mind of the one who knows everything. But you know better, right? You know better than God? None of us do. And so the Bible says also in Acts 2.23, the first time that Peter gets to preach the gospel, that this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. It was God's definite plan. 
He knew how things had to be if we're going to be saved. Now, some people ask, why did God ever create human beings knowing that we would sin? I don't know the whole answer to that, except I know that He's a God of love. And I believe that He created us out of love. He wanted to love us, and He wanted us to choose to love Him back, but He knew that that we wouldn't easily make that choice. And even before He created us, He made a plan to ransom us from that terrible situation in which we'd enslave ourselves before the foundation of the world. If there were another way to save the souls of men, Jesus says that He could have aborted His mission calling 10,000 angels. In Matthew chapter 26, while he's still in the garden, he's finished praying, his betrayer and that crowd that came with him have shown up. Here's what verses 53 through 56 say. It's Jesus speaking. Peter has just drawn a sword and, and cut off the ear of the servant of the high priest. Jesus picks that ear and puts it right back on that man's head. And he says, Do you think that I cannot appeal to my Father, and He will at once send me more than twelve legions of angels? But how then should the Scriptures be fulfilled, that it must be so? At that hour, Jesus said to the crowds, Have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs to capture me? Day after day I sat in the temple teaching, you did not seize me. But all this has taken place that the Scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled." And all the disciples left him and fled. I have read this morning from 1 Peter 1 and Acts chapter 2 that this was God's plan before the creation of the world. And now I have heard Jesus say what is happening here is what God told would happen through the prophets in the Scriptures hundreds of years before His time. Now if I read my Bible right, Most of that prophecy about Christ ending up at the cross happened two to three thousand years after this world came into existence. So God had formulated this plan before the creation of the world. And then progressively, through time, He communicated it through His prophets before it ever happened. I see two or three thousand years there for God to come up with a better plan, if there is one. But obviously there was no other way. This was God's plan. This was what He revealed. This was the plan, and Jesus would see it to completion. He fought a gut-wrenching battle inside Himself in the Garden of Gethsemane. Charles Hodge well said, Jesus gave his soul in the garden, his body on the cross. Because when he'd finished praying, when Judas arrived with all of those opposers, Jesus got up and went what he came and did what he came to do. As I direct your minds to Matthew chapter 27, verses 45 and 46, we see Jesus on the cross. And the Bible says, Now from the sixth hour, there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. That's noon to three o'clock. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lema sabachthani. That is, my God, my God. Why have you forsaken me? We will never, ever know the depth of pain in that loud cry. Not in this life. And as I've been thinking real hard about this in the past week, I'm really convinced that those of us to go to heaven will never have an idea what that was like. What kind of Mental and emotional torture was Jesus going through on the cross? I don't think I'll find that out in heaven. I think the only people who will ever get an inkling of what was going on 
inside Jesus when he said, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Are the people who spend eternity in hell. I kind of think they're going to know something that we're never going to know if we go to heaven. Well, why is that? David Farr, in his good book, Voices of Calvary, highlights these parallels between Jesus' six hours on the cross and hell forever. One, Jesus suffered unfathomable mental and physical anguish. And hell is torment day and night forever. Revelation 20, verse 10. Two, Jesus' companions in suffering were criminals. And the company of hell will consist of all that's morally and spiritually vile. Revelation 21, 8. Three, Jesus suffered in a world covered in darkness. And hell is the blackness of darkness forever. Jude, verse 13. Jesus said, I thirst, while he was on the cross. And souls in torment seek the relief of even a drop of water. Luke 16, verse 24. Fifth, Jesus' anguish was both in flesh and spirit. And he warned that God is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Matthew 10, 28. And sixth, Jesus spoke of being forsaken by God with implications too dreadful to contemplate. And everlasting punishment is being separated from the Lord. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 9. When Jesus said, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He said exactly what Psalm 22, verse 1 says. When I go to heaven, I wonder if I would find out from Jesus that while he was on the cross, he worked his way all the way through that psalm in his mind. He begins, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? David wasn't talking about himself. He was speaking words that, that he probably didn't understand fully would belong to Jesus on the cross. But that psalm works its way from this anguished cry... In its first half, it's all about this agony. And then it turns to trust in God who can help and who can save. And it ends with praise, a proclamation of the righteousness of God. And So I think there we see even then, not long after he he, he lets out this anguished cry that Jesus is enduring the cross for the joy that's set before him. But what anguish was there? And Jesus had suffered death on the cross, had been buried, and had risen from the dead. The message was still the same. I see how long I've been preaching, and I'm not going to go read these passages, but Jesus is on the road to Emmaus with two disciples who are so disappointed that, that Jesus had died. They put all their hope in him. They thought he's the one they'd been looking for. Well, he's risen from the dead now, and, and some women have begun to spread that news. They've seen him, they've talked to him, but these guys wouldn't believe it. And Jesus challenged them for being so slow of heart to believe what's written in the Scriptures, and in the Law, in the Prophets, in the Psalms. And He began from there to teach them what's there about His suffering and then His resurrection. He gets together there toward the end of the chapter with His closest disciples, and the message is the same. He opens up the Scriptures, the Law, the Psalms, and the Prophets. And they said that it was necessary for the Christ to suffer, to be buried and raised from the dead, for repentance and remission of sins to be preached, beginning at Jerusalem. So that's what the apostles preached. In Acts chapter 3, verses 18 to 20, Peter said, But what God foretold by the mouth of all the prophets, that his Christ would suffer, he's fulfilled. Repent, therefore, and turn again, that your sins may be blotted out, that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that He may send the Christ appointed for you, Jesus. As Paul preached, everywhere he went, he tried to find a synagogue. In Acts chapter 17, verses 2 through 4, he's in Thessalonica. 
and he enters and he opens the Scriptures, explaining and proving that Jesus is the Christ and that the Christ must suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. It was necessary. Are you persuaded? It was necessary. There's no other way. Sin is that bad that that's what it's requiring if you and I are going to be saved. Sin is not just regrettable, it's revolt. It makes us God's enemies, Romans chapter 5 and verse 10. It leaves us with hostile minds toward God, Romans chapter 8, verse 7. Sin is that bad. Jesus is that good. He was absolutely sinless. And He took that sinless life and bore our sins in His body on the tree, 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 24. He died as our substitute. 1 Peter 3.18 For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring us to God. Why did Jesus have to die for your sins? It was necessary. If He hadn't died for them one day, you would die for them forever. But He suffered and died, the righteous for the unrighteous. He rose from the dead. 1 Peter 3.21 says, And now baptism saves you. Not the washing away of the filth of the flesh, but as the answer or the interrogation of a good conscience because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He's at the right hand of God. It was absolutely necessary. And if it's going to count for you, if you don't want to pay for your own sins, then it's necessary for you to come to Jesus to repent and be converted, to repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And it's necessary, fellow Christian, having been to the cross, that we die to sin and live to righteousness. 1 Peter 2.24 Where do you stand in relation to the cross of Christ? It's time to come and allow Him to wash you clean. Will you come while we stand and sing together?